Well, to tell the honest truth, he was hardly noticed. For one thing, the first machines were so bulky that you could hardly move them, and besides that, they required such extensive maintenance that it was quite natural that the place where people tried to use the machine was the same laboratory where the machine had been developed. Secondly, his somewhat invisible work was without any glamour. You could show the machine to visitors, and that was several orders of magnitude more spectacular than some sheets of coding. But most important of all, the programmer himself had a very modest view of his own work. His work derived all its significance from the existence of that wonderful machine. Because that was a unique machine, he knew only too well that his programs had only local significance. And also, because it was patently obvious that this machine would have a limited lifetime, he knew that very little of his work would have a lasting value. Finally, there's yet another circumstance that had a profound influence on the programmer's attitude towards his work. On the one hand, besides being unreliable, his machine was usually too slow and its memory was usually too small. That is, he was faced with a pinching shoe. While on the other hand, it's usually somewhat queer order code would cater for the most unexpected constructions. And in those days, many a clever programmer derived an immense intellectual satisfaction from the cunning tricks by means of which he contrived to squeeze the impossible into the constraints of his equipment. Two opinions about programming date from those days. I mention them now. I shall return to them later. The one opinion was that a really competent programmer should be puzzle-minded and very fond of clever tricks. The other opinion was that programming was nothing more than optimizing the efficiency of the computational process in one direction or the other. The latter opinion was the result of the frequent circumstance that indeed the available equipment was often a painfully pinching shoe. And in those days, one often encountered the naive expectation that once more powerful machines were available, programming would no longer be a problem. For then, the struggle to push the machine to its limits would no longer be necessary, and that was all what programming was about, wasn't it? But in the next decade, something completely different happened. More powerful machines became available not just an order of magnitude more powerful, even several orders of magnitude more powerful. But instead of finding ourselves in the state of eternal bliss of all programming problems solved, we found ourselves up to our necks in the software crisis. How come? There is a minor cause. In one or two respects, modern machinery is basically more difficult to handle than the old machinery. Firstly, we've got the I.O. interrupts, occurring at unpredictable and irreproducible moments. Compared with the old sequential machine that pretended to be a fully deterministic automaton, this has been a dramatic change. And many a systems programmer's gray hair bears witness to the fact that we shouldn't talk lightly about the logical problems created by that feature. Secondly, we've got machines equipped with multi-level stores, presenting us problems of management strategy that, in spite of the extensive literature on the subject, still remain rather elusive. So much for the added complication due to structural changes of the actual machines. But I call this a minor cause. The major cause is that the machines have become several orders of magnitude more powerful. To put it quite bluntly, as long as there were no machines, programming was no problem at all. <laughs> right? 
And when we had a few weak computers, programming became a mild problem, and now we have gigantic computers, programming has become an equally gigantic problem. In this sense, the electronic industry hasn't solved a single problem, it has only created them. It has created the problem of using its products. To put it in another way, as the power of available machines grew by a factor of thousand or more, society's ambition to apply these machines grew in proportion. And it was the poor programmer who found his job in this exploded field of tension between ends and means. The increased power of the hardware, together with the perhaps even more dramatic increase in its reliability, made solutions feasible that the programmer hadn't dared to dream about a few years before. And now, a few years later, he had to dream about them. And even worse, he had to transform such dreams into reality. Is it a wonder that we found ourselves in a software crisis? No, certainly not. And as you may guess, it was even predicted well in advance. But the trouble with minor prophets, of course, is that it's only five years later that you really know that they had been right. Then, in the mid-sixties, something terrible happened. The computers of the so-called third generation made their appearance. The official literature tells us that their price-performance ratio has been one of the major design objectives. But if you take as performance the duty cycle of the machine's various components, little will prevent you from ending up with design in which the major part of your performance goal is reached by internal housekeeping activities of doubtful necessity. And if your definition of price is the price to be paid for the hardware, little will prevent you from ending up with a design that it's terribly hard to program for. For instance, the order code might be such as to enforce, either upon the programmer or upon the system, early binding decisions presenting conflicts that really cannot be resolved. And to a large extent, these unpleasant possibilities seem to have become reality. When these machines were announced and their functional specifications became known, quite a few among us must have become quite miserable. At least I was. It was only reasonable to expect that such machines would flood the computing community. And it was therefore all the more important that their design should be as sound as possible but a design embodied such serious flaws that I felt that with a single stroke the progress of computing science had been retarded by at least ten years. It was then that I had the blackest week in the whole of my professional life. Perhaps the most saddening thing now is that even after all those years of frustrating experience, Still, so many people honestly believe that some law of nature tells us that machines have to be that way. They silence their doubts by observing how many of these machines have been sold. <laughs> and derive from that observation the false sense of security that, after all, the design cannot have been that bad. But upon closer inspection, that line of defense has the same convincing strength as the argument that cigarette smoking must be healthy because so many people do it. <laughs> it is in this connection that I regret that it's not customary for scientific journals in the computing area to publish reviews of newly announced computers in much the same way as we review scientific publications. To review machines would be at least as important. And here I have a confession to make. In the early 60s, I wrote such a review with the intention of submitting it to the communications of the ACM. But in spite of the fact that the few colleagues to whom the text was sent for their advice urged me all to do so, I didn't dare to submit it fearing that the difficulties either for myself or for the editorial board would prove to be too great. This suppression 
was an act of cowardice on my side 